Well, here we are at the U.S. elections all over again. Do you know that for most of my adult life, I never voted? And that's because I was raised in a church that really felt strongly that we were not to get involved in voting and that it was wrong. And they gave a lot of biblically supported scriptures and concepts to convince us all that we wanted no part of all of that. And all kinds of reasonings were given. So I could not have given this sermon even as recently as 15 years ago. But since that time, it's like God's Spirit's been prodding me to, to re-look at it again. And God's Spirit has it's been telling me too that, hey, you know, you're a student. You're supposed to be a lifelong student. And students learn continually and, and grow in, in their understanding and, and grasp. You're supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and, you know, of, of him and, and, and of the word. So um, that's what I'm hearing uh, God telling me, that I have to look at things over again. Now, this is such a dramatic year. 2020 is going to be a pivotal turning point year. I think all of us would, would understand that, that the two sides in America, at least, are so diametrically opposite from each other. It used to be in the older days that uh, in the last two or three elections before, uh, before the very last one, I, I'm talking about 2008, 2012 in particular, uh, there sometimes wasn't as crisp a, a difference between uh, the ones running from one, uh, on one party and the others uh, running on another party. Uh, they really were all part of the same overall genre, I felt, at the time. But this year, more so even than 2016, uh, forgetting the personalities involved, and let's talk about the issues, it's night and day. And so, but does it matter? Should God's children vote? Does God want you to vote? Anyway, welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, the host and founder of it. And I hope you'll enjoy, and I hope you'll get a lot of thought-provoking material from this teaching sermon today. And I hope that if you do, that you will tell others about it as well. Whether you all are already committed to voting or uh, committed to not voting, I hope you'll give this a good listen and uh, ponder it, get back with me with your feedback. I'd love to hear that. So here's some things I want to say, though, that before I get started into the scriptural reasons and all that, whatever, you, uh, whatever your beliefs are, number one, this is going to be a pivotal year. Satan's foul spirit is running rampant out there and infecting an awful lot of people to riot and loot and burn and to be disrespectful and attack police. And all of these things are going on. And uh, mostly from the who would be the voters from one particular party. So our real enemy, though, are not the people doing that. I want to keep saying that over and over as I have in recent sermons. The real enemy is Satan. That's what his name means, adversary. And his demonic forces that are at work with him. So we must continue to pray thy kingdom come and understand that the people out there, uh, they're not our real enemy. I do wonder sometimes if Satan hasn't already attacked God's throne as Revelation 12 verses 9 to 12 talk about and has been cast back down to earth already. I don't know. So anyway, number one, 2020 is going to be a critical year. Number two, there's no clear command of the Bible that I can say, that I can see that says vote or don't vote. Or that it's a sin to vote, or that it's, or that it's a, a, a sin not to vote. I, I don't see anything in the Bible about that. I do see in the Bible in Acts six, uh, the first six verses, that the apostles ask the brethren who were from all all around the Middle East at that point. They were there for the holy days. Uh, the, he asked the brethren to uh, select seven men to be the deacons of the church. However, they did that. Uh, might, might have included voting or, 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 or you know, whatever. however they did it. Uh, some feel that could be a, an example of voting in the Bible. But whatever each believer, here's another point, whatever each one's beliefs are on voting, uh, we have to honor that. Nobody should judge me or judge, I shouldn't judge you if you decide to vote or not vote. That's your call and it shouldn't affect our fellowship and our commitment to each other. Uh, I can, I can uh, respectfully agree to disagree with you. You can respectfully agree to disagree with me. I hope it doesn't mean you stop listening to my sermons. So, you know, um, and I'm, like I say, I'm still a student too, so I'm still learning too. And then also, whatever one does this year, the Bible is very clear in Romans 14, 23, 
very, very clear that whatever is not of faith is sin. The context of that was people were arguing about whether they should eat meat or not. And Paul is explaining to the Romans, you know, that's not the point. The point is whatever you do, you've got to do it confidently. You have to do it from a good conscience with faith. And so even though it might be right to eat meat, if you can't do it with a good faith and conscience, for you that would be a sin, Paul says. And don't put a stumbling block for the sake of meat and drink in front of your brethren. The same thing here, conscience and faith can be educated. Uh, we, can be, we, we can be shown that our conscience is hurting us because of wrong information. Uh, that's true. But in the end, don't vote if it's going to hurt your conscience. Vote if it's going to hurt your conscience. Don't, you know, do vote uh, if, if, if you can without hurting your conscience. So Romans 14, 23, it's not a matter of saying it's right or wrong. It's a matter of saying you've got to feel good about what you're doing. Romans 14, 23, for whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, <clears throat> when I vote, I personally will not be voting for a particular people for particular people or party. That's not going to be my focus. It might look like that's my focus. When I check the boxes, it might look like that's what I'm doing. But right now, I'm going to tell you right now that what I will be involved in is more voting on issues, principles that are important to God and God's word and to me and to our country than it will be voting for particular people. Why is that? Because people are flawed. Even people in the Bible, Abraham and Noah. Noah got drunk and a horrible thing happened. And Abraham lied about his own wife a couple of times and other issues that were, were involved there. And then there's David. David had several, several issues besides Bathsheba. The numbering of Israel resulted in 70,000 Israelites killed because of what he did. How about Samson, Sarah, Bathsheba? All of them were flawed. And today, I look at the great country we have and I ask myself, really, are these the two best people we can put out there? But that is what the country picked and God's going to use one of them. And um, I'll talk more about that in a second. But both of them, I feel, are terribly flawed. So it makes you wonder. But what we can do is Vote, if we're going to vote, vote on the issues and the principles. Another point, I also believe the will of God is going to be done. And so whether I vote or not or for whom, and that's why some of you don't vote, but we'll talk about this. I accept what God does and what God allows. But we'll talk about that point too as we go along. Uh, God does pick the leaders of a country, all, every country, every leadership. Romans 13, 1 and 2, I'll read that later on. It's very clear that the authorities that be are there by God's choice. And so what's the point in voting if God's going to pick whom he wants anyway? So we'll talk about that too. So hear me out. And if you end up deciding you are going to vote but haven't registered to vote yet, in most states, you have until October 3. In some states even later, I think Missouri is still October 7. Uh, in most states, you have until October 3. So, so hurry, you know, register to vote if you're going to vote and haven't yet. Uh, but without a doubt, the results of the 2020 elections, whenever we finally see the final results, are going to be, uh, it's going to be a tipping point year, no matter who wins. I believe we are in the most significant time in American history since the Civil War. I really do. I've spoken recently about, in other sermons recently, about how Yehovah wants his children to stand in the breach, the gap, the broken part down of the broken down part of the wall. Stand in that breach. Give him reasons why he shouldn't punish the nation severely. He wants you to sp stand up to him. I'm going to read all those verses and say, here's why we need you to be merciful. Now, we in America, those verses were given for Israel, but we in America are part of the uh, tribe of Joseph, uh, of the 12 tribes. I believe that totally. And I believe God wants us standing up and defending uh, why uh, he needs to be very merciful to the nation and to work things out. So here's an example of what I'm talking about, standing in the breach and making your, your, your and why I'm going to vote. 
point, big, big point now why I'm going to start voting. We live in a country that's spiraling down on the major issues, lots of major issues. But let's talk about abortion, for example. Since Roe v. Wade in 1973, 62, that's 62, 62 million unborn boys and girls have been murdered in abortion, have been torn apart, cut apart, sucked out, salted out, thrown away. 62 million. Do you realize that that's more than the combined, pop or about the same, as the combined populations of Australia and Canada put together? Do you realize 62 million is just slightly less than the 68 million of Britain or the 65 million of France? It'd be like everybody in France who lives there and that on that country, in that country, would be killed. That's what we've done with abortion. Other things besides abortion are being changed. We have the definition of marriage as it was changed in 2015. The Defense of Marriage Act between one man and one woman was struck down. Somehow as being unconstitutional, though the Constitution mentions nothing about that. This year, the definition of gender was all thrown topsy-turvy. We have all kinds of things happening. We have white people, especially white men, being disparaged simply because they were born white. It used to be that the racist fears were against blacks. Now it's against whites. That if you're a white man in particular, you have white privilege and you have uh, white problems because you're born white. That's what we're being told. Thank God that President Trump put a stop by executive order, he, he's ordered that these classes and seminars be stopped, uh, basically dividing away the, the white men and women in the room, especially the white men, and saying, you're part of the problem. You're an oppressor just because you're white. Male masculinity is now called toxic. Genders, fatherhood, female, male, all of that's up for grabs. Everything is getting confused. And I think we're... And by the way, I talked about this in length, at length in the sermon on understanding the times in which we live. I hope you'll listen to those two. Now, my question is, with all this going on, and with 62 million little defenseless babies, I meant to wear my little foot, size of a little unborn fetus foot. Does God want you and I to... Does God want me, you and me, to stand aside, to remain silent, to do nothing while all this is going on? Are we even praying about it, about the nation, about the abortions? I hope we at least do that. But I think the strongest tool God has given us by living in America, besides the ability to pray to him fervently, which is our strongest, always our strongest tool, and Daniel, you know, he was ordered, all the kingdom was ordered, no one shall pray except to uh, the God or to, the, or to Nebuchadnezzar himself. And uh, Daniel totally disobeyed that. He was going to pray to God, and uh, he did. So prayer, though, is our biggest tool. But the next biggest tool we have, I believe, in this country is to vote and to tell the country, to tell uh, by our vote, which way we feel is important. Now, let's be turning to Leviticus 20. In ancient times, the nations around Israel, they, they had this god name or idol named Molech. And it's M-O-L-E-C-H, M-O-L-E-C-H. Some, some spell M-O-L-O-C-H. But I believe it's E-C-H in the Bible. It got to where the nations were offering their babies, born babies, to Molech. And the fire and the burning metals and everything were ter terrible. So they'd have trumpeters. They would have uh, people beating on drums and trumpeters and music and things going on very loudly to try to drown out the screams of that poor defenseless little boy or little girl. 
And God was so upset with this that he says in Leviticus 20 that, hey, this is not going to be going on when, when you move into the promised land or I'm going to be really, really, really upset. And so he says in Leviticus 20 verses 1 to 5, Then Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Again you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever the children of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel who gives any of his children or descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Now we can't and don't go around today advocating, or can we even uh, try to kill anybody who's committing abortion? No, we, and I'm not saying that. I am saying in biblical times, that's what God said to do. Today, though, we can vote out some of these things, perhaps, at least we can say that we're not happy with it. I'm not advocating we go stone anybody at this point. That's not the law of this land right now. But God wants to make it very crystal clear. He's against this. And I will set, verse 3, I will set my face against that man. And I will cut him off or cut off from him his people because, I'll cut him off from his people because he's given some of his descendants to Moloch to defile my sanctuary, profane my holy name. Verse 4. And if the people of the land should in any way, now this is the point I want you all to see. Even if you yourself weren't participating in it. Verse 4 says, If the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, when he gives some of his descendants to Moloch and don't kill him, they hid their eyes, they pretended they didn't see it, they looked the other way. They did nothing about it. God says, then I will set my face against that man and his family. I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. So if you see this going on and you do nothing about it, God says, you're guilty. You're guilty as well. You hid your eyes from it. You did nothing. Did you get that? Today in America alone, we've sac sacrificed 62 million defenseless little babies. On the altar of it's not convenient. On the altar I can't afford a baby. On the altar this was unplanned. You should see the movie Unplanned, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Unplanned. Please do. God is saying you and I cannot just stand by. You and I cannot just hide our eyes. When we see wickedness like this level going on, we cannot allow 62 million more be killed, salted out, cut out, sucked out, killed, and do nothing. God's saying he won't tolerate inaction. Some of you will say, come on, Molech sacrifices and abortion are two different things. Well, today it's the unborn children. And it's coming to the point where even Governor Northam of uh, Virginia said, even if the baby is born, we'll make it comfortable. We'll keep it warm and until the mother decides what she wants to do with that baby. A born baby. You have the state legislature of New York already has passed a law up to the point of delivery. That child can be born. I, I have children born prematurely. And they're fine adults today. What are we coming to? What are we coming to? Many of you say you're against abortion. But what have you publicly said or done about it? God says you hide your eyes and do nothing. That's bad. Doesn't want us doing that. Leviticus 20 verse 5 and 4. Have you at least said something on Facebook about it? Have you at least liked a comment from someone saying something about abortion? Or do you rather not get involved in something so controversial? And so you hide your eyes. Have you been a part of a right to life march? I have. Have you stepped up? Or are you hiding your eyes from the barbarism going on? Are you saying nothing about it? Because it's so controversial, you want to go along to get along. 
Well, take it up with God, because he strongly condemns the hide your eyes attitude and going along to get along. He says, I'll read it again in Leviticus 20, verse 4 and 5. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man who's sacrificing his children, when he gives some of his descendants, then don't kill him, then I will set my face against that man and their family. We can all do certain things. And you all know, don't you, that the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, Margaret Sanger, maybe, we'll, maybe we can have a graphic of her. She was a notorious eugenicist who hated blacks, who wanted to limit the number of blacks. And abortion was her way of, and she put most of the Planned Parenthood clinics are in black neighborhoods. Most of their clients, proportionately at least, are black. Black children are being killed. That's not right with God or me, nor should it be with you. And if we can affect that by voting, if we can affect that by prayers, if we can affect that any way we can, we should be doing so. Anyway, but Margaret Sanger started these clinics, Planned, Planned Parenthood clinics, to, in the beginning to try to stop the spread of black lives. Did you know that? Did you know that? So we can also join the Right to Life marches. Those are going on. They had a big one. They have big ones in D.C. You never hear about it on the news. Fox News might give you a few seconds on it. Most of the media totally ignores it. President Trump addressed that group this year. I have attended Right to Life. I hope you guys will too. Start to stand up. Start to speak up. Take a stand. We can't be Laodicean and lukewarm about this. We can't be later seeing about it. You can help fund and support crisis pregnancy clinics. Those are clinics that sometimes are fairly close by to Planned Parenthood clinics. And the goal is, hey, before you abort and kill that little baby growing inside of you, let us show you what the baby looks like. And, and also, we want to help you with that pregnancy. We want to help you with that little boy or girl. We want to give you some money. We want to help you get it set up. And so the, the crisis pregnancy centers, see if you can support some of those with your money. I have, and I hope you will too. And I'm only saying things like I have to let you know I'm not just talking a bunch of hot air here. This is something I believe in. So in our society today, the way we take action is to use the gifts God's given us and the opportunities God's given us. And we live in a democratic, uh, I don't mean the Democrat party, but the democratic republic, and we choose our own leaders by voting for those who support the issues that we believe in, that the Bible stands for, that you stand for. And, and then also by voting, uh, we can uh, vote the, the senators we want in there because they're the ones who get to pick the judges, the federal judges all over the country, the Supreme Court judges who enforce the laws. In the past, they've been making the laws. That's not their role. But uh, we need to have some conservative judges. So... We need that going on as well. And I'm going to show you later on, in case I forget it. We are to pray for the leaders that we may live a peaceable life. If we get the right people in there who don't put up with this rioting going on, all of the rioting and all the looting and, and, and burning uh, have been in Democratic, Democrat-run cities, Democrat-run cities and, and states. And by the way, their chiefs of police in most of their cases are black. Their mayors in many cases are black. Their district attorneys in many cases are black. And it's still going on. Because anyway, the Black Lives Matter group, they don't like uh, the black police. They call them traitors, Uncle Toms and everything. Terrible thing. So just on the issue of abortion alone, God is saying to his people, don't you dare think that you can stand by when you have an ability to cast a vote for the side that's against abortion, for the side that wants to severely limit it or cut it out, and, and you do nothing to stop this evil? Nothing? What are you doing? Can we say we really care if we do nothing? That's what Laodiceans are like. Let's not be Laodicean. So I'm going to devote much prayer to God about this coming election and to absolutely pick the one he wants while I also vote the issues. God will put in who he wants to put in. 
and then I'll accept God's decisions. I will, and I'll be at peace with it. God wants me, though, and you to do something, to speak up, stand up, and he'll, and he'll do what he wants to do. But he wants to see what we want to do as well, what we want to stand up for. And remember also that God will protect bare minimum. I hope you're sighing and crying over the abortions and the rioting and the killing and the looting and the destruction. Ezekiel 9, the first nine verses. Read that again. I've read it several times in recent sermons that God says to his messengers, go and put a mark on those who sigh and cry for the abominations that are being committed in the land. Put that on the screen, Ezekiel 9, verses 1 to 9, so people can write it down. Sigh and cry. And they're protected from being killed. They're protected. So at least do that. But besides prayer, the strongest thing you and I have been given is the vote. And remember, we're all going to be judged largely, partly, by what we've done with what we've been given. And whether we just remain silent and hit our eyes and stood on the sidelines, hit our eyes, hit our eyes from admitting the sins that were going on. So number one, God wants you to do something about these major sins going on when you have the ability to do something. The main way you and I have an ability to change things is by voting. I found it astonishing that 24 million, in one report I read said that, others said it wasn't quite that high, but 24 million conservative, Bible-believing Christians, evangelical Christians, stayed home in 2016 and did not vote at all. 24 million. I used to be one of those, a conservative Christian who did not vote. No more. No more. Now, the second one, the first one was, you've got to do something. The second one is God wants us standing in the gap. God says, as he did through Mordecai to Esther, hey you, do you think you can just ignore all this going on? That our nation, our people, Mordecai was a Jew, Esther was a Jew. They didn't know she was a Jew. The most beautiful woman in the land. And Mordecai says, Esther, you've got to do something. You're the queen's consort. You're the queen's, the king's, I mean, wife. And, and he will maybe listen to you. I know he, Esther says, he hasn't bidden for me for over a month. If I just appear in his presence without his bidding me to come, I could die. And then Mordecai says his famous words, we'll, we'll read later on, that if you think you can get away with it right now, forget it. That's not where it's going to happen. Who knows whether you were created to be part of this time, in this moment, that you were created for such a time as this. Our God has always been very interested to see how strongly we feel in our own heart on the major issues. God wants, he seems to enjoy the heart of someone who even will stand up even to him because of their love for their people and their country. You think I'm overstating it? Don't you remember Moses? Several times with Moses. With the gold calf incident, God was ready to exterminate the Israelites to start over with Moses. Moses basically says to God, let's put it on the screen, just the text, Exodus 32, verses 30 to 33. You can write these down and go back and read them later. Exodus 32, verses 30 to 33 he basically says, if you do that, you know what? Just take me out of your book of life. If you want to do that, do it. But I want no part of that. I want no part of a future with you. That's what take me out of your book of life means. That was gutsy. God honored Moses for that. Later on in number 16, it happens again. And I'll come to that again a little bit later. God tells Moses and Aaron, get away from the mob. I'm going to wipe them out. The last half of number 16. Moses disobeyed God. He did not get away from the mob. In fact, he told Aaron to grab a censer representing the prayers of the people and to run into the midst of the mob where the plague was hitting 
Talk about standing in the gap. God, don't. Please, stop. And God stopped. How about Abraham in Genesis 18, when God told Abraham, you know what, I'm going to wipe out Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, Zoar, five cities out there that were all pretty evil. It wasn't just a commonly thought of evil, but they were evil in every way. The name of Lot never comes up in Genesis 18. Abraham simply asked God if there are 40, 30, 20, or even 10 righteous. Wouldn't you spare the city for the sake of 10? Will you let the righteous die with the unrighteous? I think he was counting Lot's family. He counted the daughters and the sons-in-law. And he figured he had at least 10 there, surely. But anyway, it didn't work out that way. But Abraham stood in the gap before Jehovah and said, surely if there be 10 righteous, you won't do this. Turn to Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 31, and you can read it on the screen. Jehovah speaking, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy. They've wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make us make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. Not in agreement with me, but on behalf of the land. Give me a reason, he's saying, why I should not destroy it. But I found none. In 2020, I want to be at least one person that will stand in the gap, and I want you to join me. I call on you to join. The complete Jewish Bible says, I sought for a man among them who could build a barricade or stand in the break to oppose me on behalf of the land so I would not destroy it, but I found no one. So therefore, verse 31, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have, look at all the fires out west. And I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says Adonai Yehovah, the Lord God. In this case, it's Adonai Yehovah. What do you do with a verse like that? What do you do with a verse like that? Where Yehovah's saying, I want you to give me a reason not to pour out my anger. And I want you to stand in the gap like Moses did. I want you to stand in the gap like Moses and Aaron did. I want you to stand in the gap. Our silence, not voting, our silence speaks volumes. Volumes. It's often been said, especially in democracies, that the silence is the same as agreement. It's seen that way anyway. When things are going on and God's people say nothing, you're basically saying it's not bad enough to speak out on. To risk your own neck or your own, uh, what could happen to you if you did stand up or, or say something. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If you and I don't speak out against the evils going on by our vote and put in people in there who are saying at least that they're committed to law and order, they're committed to the established foundational things we've grown up with about marriage and a and childhood and fatherhood and, and the father-mother-centered families. We at least should help people be in there who are more pro-life, pro-God, pro-church, pro-law and order, pro-boundaries. Pro-freedoms. We've been called to be watchmen on the walls as well. Folks, in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 33, I don't think the watchmen are just the prophets or the big evangelist types on radio or TV. All of us, in a sense, should be watchmen. All of us, in a sense, should be people saying, look what's happening. You guys open your eyes to our neighbors, to our friends, and speaking out. And if you're not going to vote, then please at least do 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 to 14. God's trying to get our attention. He hit us hard 9-11-2001. Uh, now, 19 years later, the country did not, has not really taken the warning, and I think we're going to get hit with many more big ones coming down the pike. 
But is all that written in stone beyond beyond God going back on it? Second Chronicles 7, verse 13 and 14. There's going to be a march on Saturday, September 26, 2020, in Washington, D.C. at the National Mall. It's called the prayer, the march for prayer, the march for repentance and returning to God is what it is. And many of you are thinking, well, I don't know if those are truly God's people or not. They don't keep the Sabbath or this or that. And you probably would not have encouraged the Ninevites either because they were pagan people. But they did enough. They changed enough that God Almighty took notice of it. So let's read 2 Chronicles 7 verses 13. I like to start with 13. God speaking to Solomon in a dream or vision. I said, if I shut up the sky, okay, so there's no rain, famine, drought. There's been tremendous drought in the Western states especially, and the middle America as well, but Western states especially. So dry as a bone that hundreds of fires are burning as I speak. Or if I order locusts to devour the land, or if I send a pandemic or epidemic or sickness among the people, notice who's sending these, by the way. Don't get mad at me. That's what God's saying. Then, then, if my people, not everybody else, but if my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, don't worry about the evils of other people out there. Look about your own evils, my own evils. If we can turn from our evil ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Our land needs healing. Our land needs forgiveness. I don't think we need 328 million or however, whatever our population is in America. I don't think we need every single person out there repenting and changing. Ten righteous in Sodom would have done it. Ten. I'm flying to, to Washington, D.C. on September 25 to attend September 26. I want to participate in it. I want to march in the March for Repentance and Prayer. And if you're not coming or can't come, do it at home. The next day after that, we fly back home Sunday, be ready in time for atonement. But we're having record heat waves. If I hold back the rain, droughts, two million acres of forest have burned already in California. Two million acres. A friend of mine in California says all the most beautiful spots in California are burnt. Burnt. And then, or if I send locusts, he says, Maybe some of you were aware or weren't aware that this year was the biggest year of a locust plague in decades in, in uh, northeastern Africa and Asia, parts of Asia, where billions, billions of locusts, maybe we can put a graphic up, recently swept over northeastern Africa and Asia. And they ate everything. They consumed everything that was green. The worst locust plague in decades. And now we have this epidemic, a pandemic, God's uh, wake-up call for people around the world to wake up, to repent. I'd like to ask you to look up thereturn.org, thereturn.org. And if you can't make it to Washington, D.C., at least join us on September 26th and spend at least an hour of that day, please, in prayer, just seeking God Almighty for uh, God to forgive you of your sins. Don't worry about anybody else's. And then after that, pray for this nation itself, that God will be merciful, stand in the gap. We remember to, supposed to be lights. We're supposed to be lights and salt. Salt makes a difference. Light lightens up the darkness. And if we keep, a, if we keep away from, an areas of, uh, from the areas of darkness, what good's our light? If I shine a light in a bright room, what good is it? But if I light even just a match in a very dark room, it gives light to the whole room. My salt, my life is supposed to be salt that makes a difference around me. 
And remember again, God hears even wicked people, very wicked people, if they repent and pray. I know the story of King Ahab. I'd like you guys to read it. Let's put it up there. 1 Kings 21, verses 17 to 20. Just jot it down. 1 Kings 21, 17 to 20. This horrible king, at, at the prompting of his wife, had had false accusations made against Naboth because he lusted after his... The king wanted Naboth's vineyard. And so uh, they arranged, Jezebel arranged, for Naboth to be killed. And, uh, and then the king just seized his land. God was so angry that he told Naboth, just as those dogs over here are licking up the blood of Naboth, those same dogs are going to lick up your blood because of your evil. Ahab was one of the worst kings of Israel. He walked about quietly. He mourned. I think it says sackcloth as well. I don't know that he repented. The word repented, I don't think is there. God was impressed enough with that. That was enough for God to change his own stated word. Many of you are telling me that, come on, Philip, uh, God has already said what's going to happen. Uh, he's not going to cancel the book of Revelation. I say I know my God better than that that if enough people repent and mourn and turn from their wicked ways, God's other word that he will relent, that he will forgive and he will heal the land, that he will do a Nineveh thing on us. If he doesn't, what have I lost by doing it, by getting involved? I want God to see our hearts, that we are very inclined to pray for our people. I'm also praying for God to bring President Trump to true repentance and to come to know him as the true living God. He's been prayed for by numerous other groups of ministers. Uh, I've seen pictures of ministers' hands on Trump's shoulders and head. But he's got a lot of repenting to do as well. He's very vain. He's got that New York City aggressive style that most of America doesn't care for. There's a lot... I don't like about President Trump. A lot I don't like about him. I pray that he will repent and come to find God and know God and that God will bless that and bless him, bless our country. So anyway, God tells us to stand in the gap to do what we can to avoid and stop child sacrifice, to sigh and cry for the abominations going in the land, Ezekiel 9, to besides the prayer to make actual interventions like in the case of Molech and abortions, and we intervene by the vote. Again, I see nothing that clearly says don't vote. I do see these verses I've just given you. Will you stand in the gap, God says? I found nobody standing in the gap, he says. Will you quit hiding your eyes from the killing of the babies and do something? The best thing we can do besides prayer is voting. Voting for the side that is against abortion. It's not too late for God to turn around things. Like I said about Nineveh, God's mercy is so comprehensive, so beyond what we understand it to be. So I think it's very, very important that we stand up and pray about it and, and uh, you know support the party that wants to put a wall to keep all these illegals and all these drugs and everything coming, all these drugs from coming over. I love immigrants. I married one. I married one. But she came legally to America. This election's about so many things. Now we have hundreds of highly paid seminars in businesses, in government, in the military, in West Point, and everywhere, on critical race issues, they call it, critical race issues, where basically white people, especially white men, are demon, are, 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 is demonized the word? Uh, that's not the word I'm thinking of. Anyway, they're, they're, they're given a really bad name and they're being told that they're the aggressors and oppressors and they're terrible because they're white. It's not uncommon in these seminars, apparently I hear, to divide the room, all the blacks and Hispanics over here and all the whites over here. Now the white men divide from the white women because you men are, are your toxic masculinity and your white privilege and all that that you're born with I want to put an end to that. Apparently, President Trump signed an executive order that while he's still president, 
He doesn't want those to go on in the, in the federal government, at least. Now, the nuclear family is being attacked. Father, mother, uh, and so forth. And having a dad in the home. You are racist now if you say so much as all lives matter. Even black lives matter. They don't seem to care about the 54 children, black children, shot down dead by other black people. I don't think they're aiming for the children, but stray bullets are aiming for the parents or other adults. 54 black, beautiful, wonderful children have been killed. But if I talk about that, somehow I, as a white man, am the problem. Wake up, America. Vote. Vote. Talk about the way we're going. You know, in 2015, God says, do not have anything to do with the idols of other pagan nations. In New York City, they projected, they do this frequently, I guess. I, I'm doing some research on what they have projected onto the Empire State Building. They, pro they projected animals. They projected um, uh, performers and artists and so forth. But anyway, in 2015, I believe it was, they projected right onto the Empire State Building a big, huge image of a black Hindu goddess named Kali, K-A-L-I, Kali, with a bloody red tongue coming out of her mouth. She's a violent, violent goddess. When you see depictions of her, she's carrying strands of heads of enemies that she has cut and killed. Demonic. It's absolutely demonic. Going on in our major, biggest city. Demonic. I want to pray that God help us put a stop to things like that. At least pray about it. And get people in who will fight that sort of thing. Now, let's go into some of the other reasons. What time I have left. I'm going to move quickly now why conservative Christians say they don't vote. I hope I've made a strong enough case that if I stopped right here, that you'd say, oh man, I've got to quit hiding my, my eyes from the children who are being killed. Leviticus 20, verses 1 to 5. I've got to be a man and a woman standing in the breach in the gap, even opposing God. Say, please, God, don't. Hold off. God's looking for people to be in that gap, and he finds none at the time that he speaks of. I hope right now in 2020 there will be some of us who are standing in that breach. I hope there will be some of us who are willing to speak up like an Esther, like a Moses. Okay, one reason people don't vote is they say God doesn't need us to get his will done. God's going to do what God's going to do. I have a blog, it might be a blog or a sermon, Is God's Will Always Done? Is God's Will Always Done? You would all say that it is, but why, why do we have to pray, Thy will be done here on earth like it is up there in heaven? Why do we have to pray that if God's will always is done? And there's a verse also in John where it says the, the Pharisees rejected the will of God for them that they should be baptized by, by, by John, that they should repent and be baptized. They rejected God's will for them. God let it happen because we have free moral agency. So God's will will be done whether we're involved or not is one reason people don't vote. But God loves to use people. God loves using people. My wife made such a big point of that with me, and such a great point. You know, the God doesn't need me reason not to vote is a poor reason. Very poor reason. Do you know, God didn't need David to kill Goliath. God could have handled it, give him a heart attack, give him a stroke, make him go crazy or something. But God could have done it all by himself, but he chose to use somebody, didn't he? God didn't need Esther to protect all the Jews that were going to be slaughtered. Slaughtered. He didn't need to use Esther, but he used Esther. He did use Esther, and God bless her. If you're not familiar with the story, go back and read it, but especially uh, Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Let's put it up. Esther 4, verses 13 and 14. Mordecai reminded her that perhaps you've been called for such a time as this. 
And if you don't stand up, and if you don't risk your own life, and if you don't say something and do something, God will find someone else, and you and your household will die. And so Esther fasted with her group of ladies around her for three days and three nights, and then went in. And if I die, I die, she said. Later on, you'll find she did it a second time. Went to, I didn't realize that. I was re rereading the story. She went a second time after that to, to, uh, to the king to say that we have to have a law passed that the Jews can protect themselves and fight off those who want to kill them. So anyway, did God need a Noah? Could he? Did he? Not really. Did God need an Abraham, a Moses, or anybody? No. But God enjoys using us, using people. Just like I personally enjoy, you know, I can make my, my own bed faster without the kids. But I enjoy, if I have the grandkids here, asking them to help me make the bed or help me do this or help me do that or help me make breakfast or help me make flapjacks or whatever it is. Because they enjoy it and I enjoy seeing their enjoyment and I enjoy watching them grow and learn the family way and to be together. And God Almighty is an Abba and he enjoys that so much. Yeah, God can do it without us. Aren't you glad he does like using people, though? Just like I enjoy my kids making breakfast or helping sweep the floor or water the plants or whatever it is. Some won't vote. Here's another reason. Because God chooses our leaders anyway. So whether I vote or not, hey, it's a done deal. So it doesn't matter. Romans 13, verse 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. There it is. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will be, bring judgment on themselves. There's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist, verse 1, are, the, are there appointed by God. Daniel 4, verse 17, uh, 17 the NIV version, the, the decision is announced by messengers, the holy ones declare the verdict, so that the living may know that the God Most High, the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them. I don't think this is saying he always sets over them, the, lowly, the lowliest of men. Uh, apparently that particular wording there can also be translated the most humble of men. But anyway, it says here, God sets over them the lowliest of men. I don't believe for a second that in the governments of Israel, that King David was the lowliest of men. He, he was in a sense that he was, that Jesse had even forgotten he had yet another son. His little kid out there watching the, watching the sheep. Or Abraham Lincoln, or George Washington, or Thomas Jefferson, or John Adams, or Ronald Reagan. I don't think they're the lowliest of men. But I do feel sometimes God will give us the lowliest of men, when he sees our apathy, that we don't care, that we won't stand in the gap. This could explain some of the wicked kings of Israel and Judah who are beyond terrible. This could explain some of the horrible leaders we've seen in the last century. Stalin. I think Mao was terrible. Killed millions of Chinese who opposed him. Hitler. Genghis Khan, okay, uh, the guy in Cambodia, what was his name? Or, or uh, anyway, it's it's just it's just a horrible, horrible time. Uh, but God does pick the leaders, but we're still called to pray for them, so that we may be able to lead a peaceable life. First Timothy two verses one and two. Let's put it up. First Timothy two verses one and two. So we can lead a peaceable life. If we can pray for them, is, is that so much more of a stretch than to say, can we not also vote for them and pick the ones that will give us more likelihood of a peaceable life when things finally get back to order? Some won't vote because it's all inevitable anyway, they say. Sooner or later, it's all going to end. It's all going to be rotten. It's going to be horrible. The great tribulation is going to happen. And it's all going to end for the better eventually. But a lot... Uh, but before that, a terrible time. There's nothing we can do about it. It's all inevitable. That's where you and I differ, you see, because I read the book of Jonah 
and I see Nineveh, a terribly wicked city in what is now eastern, no, western Iraq. I think it's western Iraq, the city of Mosul is where the Nineveh used to be. I see the story of King Manasseh. I see the story of King Ahab and how God spoke something already, his word. But when people repented and changed enough, God changed his word. And God also says, our God says in Amos 5.18, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. So read what scripture says to Israel, and I believe that means today, America and Judah, the Israel over there in the Middle East, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Northwestern Europe. These are the modern descendants of the ancient Israelites who were lost, quote unquote, God's punishment right now, I don't believe, is inevitable. We can help enough people see that they have to pray more, call upon God, turn from their wicked ways. That's why I'm going to Washington, D.C. That's why I'm asking you to go with me in prayer and spirit, if nothing else. Yes, there will be people of different groupings there. Yes, that's true. But so were the Ninevites. They weren't all people of God. None of them were people of God. They were pagans, for God's sake. But they turned enough. Does that mean they all started keeping Sabbath and the holy days and all of the laws of, the, of, of Torah or the Bible? I doubt it very much. But it was enough that God was impressed enough to change his own word. And remember, again, we are called to be watchmen. Ezekiel 33, after the section on watchmen, it says this in Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11. Now as for you, O son of man, say to Israel, You've said this, our transgressions, our sins are heavy on us, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we survive? Tell them as I live, the declaration of the Lord God, I take, God saying, God speaking, Ezekiel 33, verse 11, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his way, his evil way, and live. Repent, repent, repent of your evil ways. Why will you die, house of Israel? You see what he says there? I don't like even wicked people having to be killed. I would rather see the wicked person turn from his way and live. Repent of your ways. Why will you die? And continuing on in verse 14 to 16, And when I tell a wicked person, you shall surely die, but if that person repents of his sin and does what's just and right and returns collateral, makes restitution for what he's stolen, walks in the statutes of life, Without practicing iniquity, he will certainly live. He will not die, and none of the sins he's committed will be held against him. He has done what's right and just, and he will certainly live. All right? So God's word, God's word, because of his mercy, when God gives a word of punishment, because of his mercy, when we respond and repent and seek him with all our heart. He is moved by that. And he's willing, like I've just read, to not hold our sins against us individually or even nationally. Another objection people give is, we're citizens of heaven. Some, some won't vote because they consider their citizens of heaven, as Ephesians 3.20, our citizenship, King James says our conversation. It's our citizenship is in heaven, Ephesians 3.20. And Ephesians 2.19 says something similar. That's true. My primary citizenship is in heaven. But like Paul, I realize that I am a dual citizenship. Dual citizen. Paul used his Roman citizenship many times, even though Paul himself taught that our citizenship is in heaven. One time they were going to beat him, and uh, you don't beat a Roman citizen without first having a trial. And so in Acts 22, verses 25 to 29, we read the story 
Let's put it up again, Acts 22, verses 25 to 29. And he says, are you really going to beat a scourge, a Roman citizen? And then the, why, the guy, the lictor with a whip in his hand, uh, are you a Roman citizen? He goes and tells the centurion, you better not beat this guy because he's a Roman citizen. So he used that. He also used his Roman citizenship to appeal to what was the Supreme Court, to appeal to Caesar. So he used the rights of being a citizen. So the truth is we're dual citizens. Our, our country really is in heaven above. And yes, we are pilgrims on the earth. That's true too. And I'll give the scriptures uh, in, in my sermon notes. 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11 is one of them. And Hebrews 11.13. This is not where our hearts are or where we want them to be. That's all true. So in a way like Paul, though, I like to use my U.S. citizenship to sometimes call the a U.S. senator or U.S. congressman or even a state senator or congressman to ask for some help. They've helped us several times on several things over the, over the years. I think it's hypocritical to condemn voting and then to sit there and grouse and complain about every little thing. If you don't use your God-given God rights, I believe, as a U.S. citizen to vote, just as Paul had a God-given right to say, look, you can beat me if you want, but I'm a Roman citizen. I don't think that's right. Do you think that's right? So he stopped it. So if you don't vote, please never complain again about anything in this country. Some won't vote because of Revelation 18.4, to come out of her, my people, come out of Babylon, my people. Yes, you share, lest you share in her plagues. And yet every single one of you, in some way, are in a country that's really a Babylonian system. Every one of you are a part of Babylon in a way. You pay taxes to your Babylon, no matter what country you're in. It doesn't mean that we can't live in it and use the privileges we have. God even told the Jews, I need to write this, make a note of this here. Uh, uh, Jeremiah even told the Jews when they were going to, as captives to Babylon, to pray for the peace of Babylon, to settle, to build a house, to build houses and gardens and vineyards, and to do everything you can for the good of Babylon, because in its peace you'll have peace. I'll, I'll put the, the scriptures in my notes on that one. A lot of people don't realize that's in the Bible. Now think about this. So what does come out of her, my people, mean? It can't mean literally come out and leave the country. Daniel served as a top government official in Babylon and later on in Persia. Never left it. Joseph served as a top government official by God's grace. God put him there in Egypt. Now, Sodom and Egypt and Babylon are the ones that are used in the Bible as examples of, of terrible evil. And God put Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those were their Babylonish names, and Joseph into top positions. Ditto for Esther and Mordecai. God made sure they were in top positions in the Persian Empire. That was with God's blessing. Righteous Lot sat at the gate, sat in the gate of Sodom. Genesis 19, verse 1. Sitting at the gate was something that, it was a way of saying he was a government official. He was like a mayor or a judge or a counselor in some capacity over Sodom. So, there's a key to understanding what it means to come out of her, my people. In John 17 verses 14 to 19, in Yeshua's prayer of, of uh, uh, right after Passover. I've given them your word, he's saying to God here, and the world has hated them, the disciples. John 17, 14, because they're not of, of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now read what he says. I don't pray you should take them out of the world. I, I don't mean that, but that you should keep them from the evil one, from Satan. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So we are still being sent into the world. 
even into Babylon, but we're not of it. Judah in captivity was sent into Babylon, but God was hoping they would not become a part of it, of its mores, of its standard, of its values, of its religion, of its beliefs, of its paganism, of its violence. We're not of it that way. We must come out of that that way. We must not find pleasure in participating in the sins of Babylon. So come out of her has more to do with accepting their mores and their values, rejecting, I mean, their mores and values. Voting while we can can actually fight the direction the country is going in, and we can make a stand for that and show that that's one way we're coming out of Babylon is by not participating in their mores, but standing up for the right things. Okay, so where does this leave us? The main reasons I'm going to vote, I'm not going to hide my eyes anymore from the abortions going on and the child sacrifice going on to Moloch called Planned Parenthood today. God wants us saying something. God doesn't want us hiding our eyes. God wants us standing up and doing something about it. And besides prayer and besides things like supporting some crisis pregnancy centers or joining a Right to Life march, I hope you'll start doing that. The biggest thing you can do besides prayer is, is to vote. Number two, to be a man, I want to be a man standing in the breach. A gap in the wall, saying to God himself that I love him very much. But Father in heaven, please have mercy on these people. Please. Go back and read the, uh, the um, Lamentations, Book of Lamentations sometime. You'll get an idea. Moses did. Esther did. Abraham did. For Sodom. They all stood up. God is calling on you to stand up. My Bible tells me it's all not inevitable anyway. I, if my people, called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Verse 13 says, If I send the plague, if I send the drought, if I send the locusts, and I've decreed these are going to be punishments. If I see you guys out here repenting and returning to me, if enough of you do it, I don't know what enough is of 328 million or whatever our population is. But there's going to be, I hope, thousands of us in the National Mall marching for the return to God, the return to repentance, the return to prayer. I'm also going to be praying because I know we're judged partly on, based on what we've been given. Luke 12, 48, the first part of the verse. To whom much is given, much will be required. In America and the Western countries, frankly, you and I have been given an awful lot. We're one of a very, very few cultures that truly can work where we want, live where we want, do what we want, and vote for the leaders we want. We've been given very, very much, and I believe we're going to be judged. What we did with that. Because I don't see verses that say don't vote. Edmund Burke said, All that's required for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Another point, the usual objections against voting just don't bother me because I, I believe in I'm being sent into the world. That's what Jesus said. That's what Yeshua said. I, 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 like he said, I'm supposed to be salt and light, but if the light refuses to go where it's needed, if the salt refuses to be used for where it's needed, what good am I? I know I'm a dual citizen. My heart's in heaven above. That's where my heart is. But like Paul, I'll use my rights as a U.S. citizen, and I will vote. And I'm going to vote the issues, not the men, not the women, the, 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 the issues. Pro-life, pro-law and order. Pro-boundaries, pro-borders, pro-business, pro-America. So when we see all these points together in God's amazement at how few, if any, are willing to do anything, I hope I'm touching your heart that if you had decided you weren't going to bother voting this year, forget the people, vote the issues. I feel this year more than any, I must vote. I must. It's a tipping point year. 
And if God still puts in the man or party that I didn't vote for, then so be it. That must mean that his return is, the return of Christ must be very soon. I mean, within 10 years. Perhaps. I hope so, frankly. Because I pray thy kingdom come. I think 2020 is going to be a pivotal year. So if this teaching has stirred any of you, I hope you'll tell others about it. Get the word out. If you know others not planning to vote for religious reasons, please ask them to listen to this sermon. In the meantime, if you haven't registered to vote and you want to vote, don't know how to do it, just Google, how do I get registered to vote? How do I register to vote? And then put down your state in Missouri, in Florida, or whatever state you're in. And you'll get the instructions. You can also go in most states to just the public library. And they'll, uh, they'll help you. You can Google it. You can call the county elections office, the library. Many universities and even high schools will help you register to vote. Take your photo ID with you. So uh, your driver's license or passport. May God be with you as you take a stand for the right, a stand to defend the defenseless unborn babies and vote for the group, the group most likely to think the values and the mores and other points about not having abortions but protecting the unborn. I just heard President Trump say recently, the sanctity of human life from conception to death, their entire life. So I'm going to vote, and I'm going to go to Washington, D.C., and I hope you look up thereturn.org, and I hope you'll pray with me and others, and watch your news. Hopefully, they'll be on the news. It might be on, uh, might be on C-SPAN or something like that. I don't know if it will be or not, but anyway, a lot of people will be there. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your love. Thank you for your coming to Light on the Rock. May God bless you. Father in heaven, we just come before you and we ask in Jesus' name, Yeshua's mighty name, that you'll have mercy on our land, have mercy on your people. First of all, forgive us of our sins. Help us turn from our wicked way and turn to you. Enough of us turn to you, that you're pleased with us, that you're happy with us, and that you will hear our prayers, not just for ourselves, but for the whole country. Bless the return, Father. Bless those in power and authority, no matter what party they're, they're part of, and give them an open mind to lead the country the way they should. And I pray, Father, for protection on those who are standing up for you. I pray for protection on your leaders that you put there. I, I pray for protection on your guardian angels, on those who will be going to the return in, in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. We love you. We love you beyond... I just hope we even learn to love you more, just more and more and more. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for our wonderful country you've given us. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us to stand in the breach and to speak up. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.